I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 5 this morning. And we were going to do a special message for a couple who have uh, just got married on Wednesday and we're going to pray for them. But sadly, uh, they haven't managed to make it here this morning. But that's fine. I believe in divine providence, as I hope you do by now. So I don't worry about these things. I trust the Lord and I go, I'm preaching to those who are here online who need to hear the word of God. So I don't get, fl with all I've seen through the years, I've seen God's hand on this. It's important I preach this. So we're stepping out of our series. We'll come back and preach the last message next Sunday morning. But you know what? The fact that I'm here preaching this, I could have easily stayed in bed. I want to tell you this morning, I've never been in danger of falling asleep preaching, not once in my entire life. I feel the danger this morning. And it's bad when the preacher feels like that, I want to show you. But my spirit isn't sleepy, I want to tell you right now. And so I want to take you to this message. I believe it's just inserted by the providence of God. So let's take heed to it. That God could have ordained this for this morning, this time. And maybe you're the one that's here to hear this for a specific reason. Ephesians chapter 5. My message this morning, I'm just inserting this. I had three points, but I'm only going to preach two of them. I just want to be very clear. And my message is a search for a perfect relationship. Ephesians chapter 5. And because what triggered this? was the fact that you had a couple who have lived together as husband and wife for many years. Many years, raised children. They believe in God. They believe in Christ. And yet their relationship is unbiblical. And yet they have real convictions about a real God. And it takes all these years until the issue of salvation gets dealt with. And the Holy Spirit begins to deal with what is true salvation, that they then put their marriage in order. That's remarkable. That means that this issue of the real new birth, real salvation, actually can be tied into marriage. And I'm going to show you this. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery that I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We bless you. Lord God, we, we do believe in your hand guiding and orchestrating all things. And Father, so we love you. We bless you. We adore you. We happily, Lord God, walk in your will and walk under the light and the shadow of your word. Father, we love the fact that your light, your truth is shining on our pathway. Lord God, it's not left for us to figure out. It's not left for us, Lord God, to create something. But Lord God, we're instructed simply to follow you and to walk in the light, even as you walk in the light. And my God, I, I pray, oh God, bring us to this penetrating light. You say in John chapter 3 that they do not come to the 
light because they do not want their works to be rebuked. They stay in the dark. They stay in the shadows. They stay away from the blind and light of truth, O oh God, because they love their sin. They love their darkness, O oh God. They, they love how things are outside of written scripture. But Lord God, we're those that desire the light to shine upon us, the convicting light, nor God, the searching light, the revealing light, the light that leads us unto the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a church, we want to be a bride being prepared by the truth of God in Jesus' <coughs> mighty name. Amen. <coughs> My message, a search for a perfect relationship. You may say there is no such thing as a perfect relationship. I disagree. You see, I know there is such a thing as a perfect relationship. I know that. I know God has ordained it, planned it, provided for a perfect relationship. But it's not among men. It's not a marriage. It's not with a girlfriend or a boyfriend. It's not in an engagement. It's not in satisfying your sexual desire. That isn't where you're going to find a perfect relationship. There is only one perfect relationship that is faultless, that doesn't lack. There's actually only one person who can possibly fulfill that desire. And you won't find it, humanly speaking. You only find it in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, I believe God has created all men. All 8 billion men and women on our earth and all those who have lived all through the ages since Adam and Eve, I believe God created man innately to desire and to long after and to search for a perfect relationship. I believe that's in you this morning. I believe it's God ordained and I believe sin blemishes it. That within each one of us, our desire is for a satisfying fulfilling, securing relationship. And I believe that marriage is connected into that. God has put within man and woman a desire for a close-knit, unique, unusual relationship. I believe that is God-given. I believe marriage is ordained of God. I believe that most people, though not all, have a desire within their heart to meet that special person, that unique person, and to enter into a perfect human relationship that will satisfy them. I believe that desire is a natural desire, God-given, but that sin blemishes it. We know that all through our world. It is not wrong to desire communion and fellowship and friendship within a special bond. It is God-given. And you know what? I believe God uses the marriage relationship to typify our relationship as the church with Jesus. I believe there's similarities in what we have just read. Look at verse 32 with me for a second. It says, this is a great mystery. Paul has been preaching from verse 22, all about husbands and wives, the marriage relationship. He is teaching all through these verses, parallel the relationship between a man and husband, a man and his wife, and Christ and the church. And he keeps parallel, saying that a husband and a wife ought to look to the church and to Christ as an example. And also that a husband and a wife ought to typify or embody those elements of Christ and the church. It goes both ways, not just one way. That ought to be our example. And after from verse 22, all the way down, then suddenly after teaching about the marriage relationship in verse 32, look what he says. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So here you have Paul teaching about marriage, what a husband is to be, what a wife is to be. And he's going through, and it is teaching for a husband and wife. It is teaching about marriage. But suddenly as he gets to verse 32, he changes the focus. 
He says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So he says, I've been teaching you about marriage. I've been teaching you about what God's will is for a husband and a wife. And now he suddenly says, hold on a second. This is a great mystery. The teaching about a husband and wife in the Bible, what is it? It is a great mystery. In other words, the greatest mystery. There are several things that Paul calls mysteries in the Bible. Several different biblical teachings, maybe 10. Very clear teachings, and he calls them mysteries. But he says this is the greatest mystery, the great one, the greatest of all the others. All of the others are mysteries, but this is the greatest mystery that Paul teaches. And he says, in teaching about a husband and wife, about the marriage, actually in that teaching is a mystery. The word mystery is the Greek word mysterion. Listen to what it means. And the Catholic Church has it wrong. They call, they translate this word sacrament. And they say marriage is a sacrament. It's not a sacrament. This word mysterion doesn't mean sacrament. Not at all. Listen to what it means. Something concealed, hidden, something you can't possibly know naturally or by observation. Something which needs to be revealed to you, to your spirit, by God. It needs to be taught to you before you can understand it accurately. So what's Paul saying here? Hidden within this teaching on a husband and wife, on a marriage, is hidden a mystery. There is something hidden within it that you can't know unless God reveals it. Unless God teaches you, you cannot possibly understand this. It is concealed. It is hidden. It is not for everybody. Do you realize so much in the Bible, like when Jesus taught parables, remember that he explained why he taught parables. We think he taught parables to make it easy for people to understand. No, not on your life. That's not true. Oh, he told nice little easy stories so we can all understand like children. No. Jesus said, I taught by parables so those who shouldn't understand will not understand. Do you realize that God will hide things from people very deliberately? Do you know even Christians in Hebrews chapter 6, it says, let us go on to perfection if God permits. So you're talking about Christians who are immature, and yet God may not permit them to go on to perfection to deeper places, to fullness and maturity. Do you know why you can't handle it? If you get taught, God sometimes will hold you back because you'll damage your soul. So God can permit you to go on. And so we have here within this teaching, there is concealed something and God has to teach it. God has to reveal it. What is it? Paul is really speaking concerning Christ and the church. There is a relationship. God has ordained marriage to satisfy, to fulfill certain things. It is a wonderful thing ordained of God. And you know what? There are many in the New Testament remain single and were single. Jesus himself, the apostle Paul, John the Baptist, Barnabas and many others that we can tell of. They taught more about marriage than anyone else, yet they were single. Do you know what? Marriage isn't the be all and end all. I want to tell you that. But that desire for a perfect relationship is hidden within both. There is a desire for this satisfying relationship. And you know what? In reality, no wife will fulfill that. No husband will fulfill that. Our entire world is searching. I mean, those who reject God, who are atheists, who don't believe in a real God, they are searching for this relationship. I believe they have an innate sense to say there's got to be a perfect relationship. I believe their heart is longing for it. 
I do. I believe the atheist is desiring that. And they go after women or after men or after some genuine friendship. That's all wonderful. To have a genuine friend who you commune with and trust with and grow up through the years. It's wonderful to have friends. And we ought to have friends. But there is an innate desire within man to go, I am longing for something. I am desiring this perfect friendship. Isn't it sad when a friend breaks your trust, hurts you, disappoints you, fails you, or a spouse, a husband, a wife? Isn't it hurtful? Isn't it disappointing when someone breaks truth, uh, breaks trust and shares something that you shared privately, intimately, in a close relationship. It happened to Patrick. If you read Patrick's letters, his soulmate, a very close friend, years later reveals a hidden secret that almost destroyed him. He he said, I was almost wrecked, almost finished, because my intimate soulmate went and revealed it openly to others, and it almost destroyed me. Do you know what? There is an innate desire for relationship, a longing. Marriage only gives us a little insight to that. It's only a little imperfect element of that. And yet in God's will, it can be wonderful and blessed of God. And so here I'm tying together in this message, a search for a perfect relationship. Or I could give it a subheading. Why is marriage being destroyed biblically? Why is marriage in our generation, why are relationships, even in the church, taken on a form that are so unbiblical and so far from God's will? They'll never satisfy the heart. If we don't have friendships and relationships built on scripture, they can never satisfy Remember what it says in Psalm 25, 14, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him and he will show them his covenant. The secret, that word secret in the Hebrew is sodi. It means a secret counsel of a group of people. I believe it's talking about Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So when you read in the Old Testament, either in the Psalms or in Job, about the secret of the Lord, It's talking about this very exclusive, very exclusive counsel of God, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. And he says he wants to invite individuals into that fellowship, that communion, that conversation, that friendship. Can you imagine that you could be invited into this council, this secret chamber of God where they talk together and fellowship and love one another. And yet there's a very select, very narrow invitation into this satisfying relationship. If you want to find satisfaction, you need to know the secret of the Lord. You need to find the secret of the Lord. In Deuteronomy 29, 29, the Lord says, the secret things belong unto the Lord, our God. But those things which are revealed belong unto us and our children forever, that we may do all the words of the law. So the secret things belong to God. Only God can reveal them. You can come into this private, secret unique relationship unless God opens it up. It is beautiful. It is genuine. When you go to the Bible, the book of Genesis, the first two, three chapters of the Bible begins with a wedding in paradise, in perfection. When you go to the end of the Bible, Revelation chapter 19 to 21, the Bible finishes with a wedding again in paradise, in utter perfection, a wedding, a wedding. Saints, we're heading for a wedding. All of this is just preparation. Even your marriage is so utterly imperfect, shallow compared to that. Do you realize that the real Christian, the real body of Christ is getting ready for a wedding, a satisfying, perfect relationship? You're imperfect. Your side is imperfect now. 
But do you realize you're being prepared for a condition of utter sinless perfection, of utter maturity, that you're going to know him as he knows you? It's going to be two-way. You are going to have such a communion with your God that now seems like darkness. It's utterly remarkable. In the Gospels, Christ performed his first miracle at a wedding in Cana. That was his first miracle, the first revealing of his divinity. You cannot fully understand marriage until you understand the relationship between Christ and his church. And I want to tell you, seeing this intimate, special, personal relationship with one other person is just a picture that there's something greater. Do you know your desire for that, to have intimacy, privacy, personal communion, all of that is really just a faint shadow of something far greater and eternal. We're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul writing to the church at Corinth, for I have espoused you, or I have engaged you, or I have betrothed you to one husband. The relationship between the church and Christ is unique. It's not many Christs, many gospels, different teachings, different revealings of Christ. It's not at all. You know what Paul is saying? There's only one husband. There's only one real church. It's utterly unique. Christ isn't going to have many brides. He's only going to have one bride. There's not going to be many Christs. There's only one Christ. And on that day, you're going to have one bride and one Christ uniquely married. We are now engaged. I'm betrothed to Christ. You as a church, you are betrothed. And Paul says that I may present you as a chaste virgin or as a holy virgin. A virgin untouched with the world, not committing fornication, not committing idolatry or adultery or any other thing that's going to blemish that. And so here, here's my two points, not three points, but two points. And I want to balance these this morning in our message. And this is them. And I believe this is what's damaged and destroyed marriage. I believe this, what I'm going to tell you has destroyed marriage. And in fact, what is it? An unbiblical relationship. You cannot have a satisfying marriage unless it's biblical. That might seem so elementary and basic, and yet it's not, it's radical. No marriage can be right unless it's biblical. And yet all across our world, marriages, relationships, and the desire for friendship is not built on scripture not prompted, not molded. How can it be right? But we're still, all across our world, those that claim to know Christ, it's not built on scripture. Churches, entire churches that think they're going to meet Christ at the marriage feast are not built on scripture. And so that's my first point, an unbiblical relationship. The problem of this hour in marriages and all relationships, including friendships, including individual friendships, and in the new birth, what is taught in the church about being born again, or those who know God. Do you know what the issue is? It's not built on scripture, on the Bible. My second point, you'll say, that was a very quick point. No, I haven't got going yet. The second point, a wrongly entered relationship. I believe this is where we've gone wrong over what's wrong with marriage or friendships. Or what is wrong with our relationship with God? Do you know what the issue is? We have entered it wrongly. The pathway into it, into marriage, into engagement, into deep fellowship has been on a wrong basis. So if you get the beginning wrong, how can it be satisfying? These are the two things I'm going to deal with here for a moment. First of all, an unbiblical relationship. So many marriages today, like I said, you've got people who say they believe in God, they follow God, they know God. Some even claim to be born again, and yet they live with a partner, 
but they're not married. They're not convicted of the Holy Spirit. We've got those who claim to be born again, yet can live in sin. Perpetual fornication, immorality, uncleanness of mind. And yet it doesn't bother them. They don't see any contradiction between having a biblical relationship and having a relationship, the words miss them. You know what's missing is the scripture. Do you know between every friendship and relationship, you ought to stick Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, just as a beginning. Do you know any young girls, they ought to stick those four gospels in between, you're gonna be pretty safe, but then you've got 66 books. Just shove all those books between him and her, and you're gonna have a lot less problems. It suddenly becomes a biblical relationship, safeguarded. And if anyone doesn't like that, there's a problem, a serious problem. I want to tell you, Scripture will guard you, protect you, and bring you into satisfying relationships. So this point, an unbiblical relationship. I believe so much is what is called a relationship with God in the church in this hour. Do you know what it's lacking is the scripture. Men tell me they know God. They've always known God. They walk with God. They hear God. They speak to God. Do you know what's missing? The scripture, the Bible, the word of God. They say they have relationship, friendship, communion with God. But there's a problem. This is lacking. There's those who say, we have a relationship together, but you're living in sin. Your relationship contradicts the Bible. Oh, but it feels so right. We're in love. Yeah, but it's unbiblical. Oh, but we love each other. We're committed to one another. Do you know what? A marriage without the Bible is an unbiblical marriage or any sort of intimate relationship that does not allow the scripture to come in and say, one man, one woman within the marriage bond on the base of scripture, those that reject that and say, I I can do whatever. Do you know what you're lacking is the scripture? Listen here, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and 6, speaking about the church at Corinth, Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? He's speaking about lifestyle in a church. And he calls it a little leaven. What was happening in the church? One man who called himself a Christian, a born again Christian, was actually sleeping with his stepmother. Sleeping with her. He claimed to have a conversion experience. He claimed to know God. He was attending meetings. He was sitting, taking the Lord's table, singing the songs in the prayer meetings. When Paul writes to them, what does he say? Talking about this issue, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. He's actually talking about cooking here, and you ladies and you guys, hopefully. (laughs) Know that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. When you're cooking, when you're there in the kitchen, and then you just take a little bit of leaven, what's called leaven or yeast, and you put it in the mixture. Oh, there's a big mixture there. But all you do is take a little bit of leaven, you put it in the mixture, and you know what? It goes through the entire mixture. If it's in the mixture, it'll go through everything. If it's tolerated, if it's allowed to stay there, if it's baked together, it goes through the entire mixture. And so Paul says, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. That's what Paul the apostle says. He says, a little leaven in the church, tolerated, undealt with. In other words, a relationship intimate between a man and woman, tolerated, just accepted, ignored, which is unbiblical and truth isn't brought to bear. You know what it's going to do? It'll destroy that entire church in a very real way. Remember what it says in Galatians 5 and 9, talking about false teaching, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. The word Little, guess what? It means small, tiny, easy to ignore. That's what little is. But it's only, yes, I know. 
But do you know what? God says you cannot ignore it. Do you know in that entire chapter about this issue of this guy in the church claiming to be born again, playing around with his stepmother? Do you know what it says in verse 2? What should happen to him? He should be taken away from among you. That's what the church needs to do. In verse 5, it says, delivered unto Satan. That's how wicked this is. Do you realize relationships not built on scripture are dangerous? Dangerous to the soul, dangerous to the church, dangerous to everything. In verse 7, it says, let that person be purged out. In verse 13, it says, put them away. In verse 11, it says, but now I've written unto you not to company if any man that is called a brother be any of these things. And he gives a list of sins. Do you know what happens in today's church? We don't list sins anymore. You're not allowed to call sin, sin. You're not allowed to define it or speak about it or warn against it or rebuke it. You're not allowed to do that in today's church because they say, oh, under grace, we don't do that. Do you know what? This is the apostle of grace. This is the apostle of the Lord Jesus. This is the Bible. And you know what he's doing? He actually says, you're not even to drink a cup of tea or eat with certain people who claim to be born again or Christians. That's why I'm so strong. And don't you claim to be born again when you're not? Because you know what? You create a whole problem for yourself because you're not what you ought to be. And you're pretending to be something and then you get judged harder. Because you'll get, you see, any sinner can come into this church, any homosexual, any trans dresser, that may shock you. If they come in and sit down, I won't be rebuking them or throwing them out. I'll go speak to them with love and kindness and grace. That is not their problem. That isn't the issue. You know what their issue is? Like you and I, sin separateness from God. That's only the outward manifestation. That is the measles spots. It's not the measles, it's the spots on the outside. And so here, the apostle Paul, he cares about right marriages. He cares about intimacy of friendship and fellowship and of sexuality. He believes in sex. Do you know, going back, everyone mocks the Puritans, don't they? Oh, you're puritanical. Have you ever heard that? And they try to mock the word Puritan by saying, you're puritanical. You don't believe in Christmas. You don't have any joy. You don't smile. You don't have any fun. I'm glad you haven't heard that derision. I've heard it widely. It's in society. Do you know it was the Puritans were the first to write books about sexuality and intimacy and the provision of God. Do you know it was the Puritans who done that? That Just after the Reformation, they're all the ones writing about a real biblical marriage. They're the ones being very open and talking about the wonderful joy of marriage in Christ Jesus. It was the Puritans. So I want to tell you, they had a biblical accurate view, not a puritanical view, but they had a pure puritanical view of it, and it was glorious. Listen to what Paul says here, because he cares about the relationship of Christ and the church, the bride. Remember, he says to the Corinthians, I have espoused you to one husband. So he cares about the relationship with God, that church. That's why he names sins. That's why he deals with sin. That's why he says, purge out the leaven. That's why he says, don't even sit and have a meal with certain people who claim to be born again, and yet they live the wrong lifestyle. What does he say? Don't even have company with these. I'm going to list them. The word company means to mix together, associate with dwell in unity with, in the church, in home, in social society, in the coffee shop, don't do it. Listen to some of these. First of all, fornicators, he mentions. Do you realize fornication destroys relationships? What is fornication? It's the word, Greek word, pornos. A fornicator is a pornos. Fornication in the Greek is Porneo, and we know what words come from that. This is every form and kind and shade of sexual immorality. It includes adultery, 
prostitution, homosexuality, incest, or any other sexual relationship out of one man, one woman, dwelling together in a unique relationship. That's what fornication is, or a fornicator, where you move into a realm that is utterly forbidden. Do you realize that someone claims to be born again, yet they're a fornicator? They're involved in sexu sexual relationships, and yet they say, but I'm born again, I'm going to heaven. You are not to eat a meal with them. You're forbidden, not by me. This word fornication is used 14 times in 1 Corinthians alone. That's how protective God is over relationships, your body. Do you realize the sin of sex outside of marriage isn't like any other sin? It's utterly unique. It affects you deeply. And it says two are made one in the Bible. He gives other things like covetousness. This is a sin not much mentioned in today's church, and yet I believe it destroys all friendships, relationships in the marriage, and it destroys the church. What is it? What is covetousness? Listen, it's a burning desire for more. It, it, it can never be satisfied. It's the deep desire within your heart to want more than others have around you. Keeping up with the Joneses, you're covetous. Never satisfied, you're covetous. Do you realize a covetous person who's driven by a desire for things, you can't separate them from their possessions or their money. They will give money to anything. This Christmas, they'll spend more money than they'd ever imag imagine to give to God. You know what that means? They are a covetous person. They're in danger of hell. You can't go to heaven and be covetous. You can't. You could be poor and covetous. You could be rich and covetous. A covetous person, burning, driven, desiring. They make their choices because of wanting more, more money. They don't need it, but they desire it. They're driven. Everything is motivated by this. You know where you're going? You're going to hell. You could claim to be born again and yet a covetous person. You could covet another man's wife. You could covet a better house or some land or someone's job or someone's beauty. If only I could look like them or someone's ministry. Never covet a pulpit or a preaching ministry. You don't know what it would cost you. Do you see these things? They will destroy marriages. You know, the number one argument they say is within a marriage is about money. Money. That, that's why I heard when I was 13 years old. That's why Candace and I never once in 16 years had an argument or friction over money. That's miraculous. But I made a decision as a kid going, do you know what? There'll never be an argument over money in our house. And many times we didn't have. Candace had to go from month to month praying money so that there'd be food on the table. It wasn't guaranteed just weeks before. But no arguments. He also says an idolater. What's an idolater? An idol worshiper. It means you use idols in worship. Not that you worship the idol. That's how Many idolaters get out of it to say, oh, I'm not worshiping the image. It just helps me to worship my God. You're an idolater. <clears throat> if you use statues, images in worship to help you, you are breaking God's commandment. This is taught in Exodus 20, Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy chapter 4, 16, 27. And again, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and 9, all of this Dealing with idolatry. You know why? Because idolatry destroys relationships. It really does. It is very, very dangerous. It says in the Ten Commandments, and of course, you know, the Catholic Church removed this, didn't they, from the Ten Commandments? And they split the one in covetousness into two. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them. It's a clear command, idolatry. Can you imagine if in my marriage, 
If Candace walked in one day and I have a statue of her, an image, it's very accurate, it's really her, and I'm kissing the cheek of that statue, saying, I love you. Can you imagine what would have happened? There would have been an almighty fight in that home. And I would have said, but I'm just loving you through, after all, this is you, isn't it? It's an image of you. I'm just trying to show affection to you, love to you, to minister unto you by showing affection to your image. You know what? She would have got very jealous, very angry. I could see her taking a hammer, a hatchet, whatever, but that statue wouldn't have remained in the home. It would have been utterly annihilated and destroyed. It would have been cast out. You better get rid of idolatry or it could destroy your relationships. Also, it mentions railer. Don't even fellowship with the railer. So a born again Christian who uses statues in worship, you're not to eat with. Oh, but I'm a born again Catholic. You're not even to eat with them. A railer. What is a railer? Someone who criticizes with abusive language or in an insulting manner. Always pouring out accusation, always causing strife. That is a railer in the Bible. Do you have anyone in your families? Do you know anyone? Are you married to someone and it's always strife, always railing, always making accusations? This is the Greek word, the meaning for a railer, quarreling, scolding, pouring forth false accusation without evidence. In Proverbs 26, 21, it says, a contentious man kindles strife. That's how you recognize a contentious man. He's always kindling, stirring strife. He cannot help it. There's a pouring out of accusation constantly. That is a railer. No born again Christian should be a railer. You know what? The new birth ought to destroy that. Do you realize that would destroy a marriage or a friendship? Is a railer being there? Do you realize that it is so destructive and dangerous? It's not only dangerous to your soul before God. God says, no railer is getting in my kingdom. You, you will not, you'll go to hell. You will go to hell. Oh, but I believe it all. And, and I've done so much and I've got a testimony and I know all this. If you're a railer, you are standing over hell on thin ice. And believe me, thin ice melts very quick over fire. Very, very quick. It also says a drunkard. What is a drunkard? The word means to drink well or fully to the point of saturation or intoxicating through alcohol. The Bible says if this person claims to be born again or once was born again, but now they habitually come into a condition where all of their senses, their actions, their speech, their abilities are numbed through alcohol, you're not even to eat a meal with them. You know why? It's, to, it's not to reject them. It's not to hurt them. It's to show them how dangerous their sin is. If you ignore such sin, say, sure, it's okay. God's a God of love. God's a God of grace. Sure, we all have our battles. I want to tell you, this is soul destroying in a very real way. And then he gives another one, an extortioner. It's the word heart packs. Do you know what it means? What is an extortioner? You could be a born again Christian and yet practice extortion. And Paul says, purge them out from the church, purge them out, cast them out. What does being an extortioner mean? It means you focus in on certain people in the church, you seize them, you catch them, you bring them into debt. It's not just about money, but someone being brought into bondage to that person. It could be through prophecies, through emotional manipulation, this is what wolves do. They extortion through their teaching. We have a gifted ministry. We prophesy. We say, thus saith the Lord. Or the Lord's told me to tell you. If you have to add God's name to make something strong in your mouth, 
You need to be very careful. Preach the gospel. Don't add God's name to it and say, I'm prophesying. It may be for money. You may be manipulating, using emotion. You know, Shiloh had took a picture of her last night, sent it to, my, um, uh, uh, to a friend and uh, some family members. And I said, um, do you think normal dogs beg like this? And that face, I'd need to show you. You wouldn't believe it. You couldn't resist this face if you tried with all of your might. She just stares. She locks in. And it's like she's trying to speak right through thoughts at your mind. It is pure, unadulterated, emotional blackmail. It's not mere begging. It's not saying I've got a need. I tell you, those thoughts are penetrating. I can almost feel them. You know what she's doing? She's working me over emotionally. Do you know emotions can be used in a terrible way? A terrible way. In the next chapter, 1 Corinthians 6, Paul goes even further. Do you see this is biblical teaching? If you remove the Bible, you get a non-biblical relationship. You get a church that's unbiblical. You get people claiming to be born again. It's unbiblical. Their relationship with God is unbiblical. How can you have all these things undealt with? You think you got born again and this got through? Oh, I'm still covetous, but God's dealing with me. I'm still a railer, but God's just dealing with me. I'm telling you, you need born again. Something is wrong. If our churches are filled with this kind of person and they haven't been dealt with and we don't deal with them when it becomes obvious, there's something wrong. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6 and 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. That tells me if anyone's committing these sins and they still determinedly say, I'm going to heaven. I know I'm born again. I know I'm eternally secure, but they're doing this. You know what it means? They're deceived. They're deceived. They don't know anything. And they're out here. I've met so many of them. We've known so many. Then Paul goes on to explain who these unrighteous are, who are deceived. He gives a few other things. Listen to what he says. Adulterers. That means a married person who's unfaithful to the marriage covenant. He adds them to the list. He says, nor effeminate. What's effeminate? It means to be soft in your garments, your clothes. That can be effeminate. To act like a lady or be the victim in a relationship. That's what being effeminate is. You are used like a woman. You might say, but I'm the victim. I can't help these desires. Do you know what? If all these arguments, and I, I, I watched a video about a week ago of a guy I once knew. He stayed in my house once. He was a young preacher on the street, a young holiness preacher. He had gravity and sincerity and seriousness and a knowledge of the truth and he preached with holy conviction. I can remember going to a meeting with him one night and after we left that meeting we got in a car and we sat for 30 minutes under the fear of God. We couldn't speak to each other. The presence of God, the fear of God. I watched a video of, of him one week ago as a preacher, a pastor. He's come out publicly and said I'm homosexual, and there's nothing sinful or unbiblical about it. And I just have to be honest and real. And now I'm realizing my Catholic friends, there's some in there as well, and we're all uniting. It's tragic. I knew that young man. He used to tremble under the fear of God. But now he goes, oh, I can't change these desires. I, I have these inclinations. I'm just being real. Can you imagine me doing that with Candace Candace, you need to understand, I need three women. I love Jesus. I'm born again. I love God with all my heart. I love the word of God. But you need to realize that this desire to adulterate, to be unfaithful is innately within me. We make homosexuality a unique sin. Do you know what? I might have to fight against unfaithfulness all my days, but there's never a justification to justify homosexual practice or being a victim or used in that way or saying I'm a victim of my desires. No way, you're guilty. That's why the Bible says you won't get in God's heaven. You're, you're lost, you will go to hell. If you play the victim, 
And the word literally means a victim used and abused. Really, you're a coward. Don't tell me you're a victim. Oh, yes, I know you may have been abused as a child. You know, he was abused by all the men in his family. Don't tell me that come out of something natural. My heart broke when I heard what happened to him as a kid. It was shocking. My heart melted towards him. But not when he comes out and he begins to deceive and lie and saying, you know what? I have a relationship with God. But he set the Bible aside to do that. It also said abusers of themselves with mankind. That's again in Romans chapter 1. You know what it says in Leviticus 18.22? Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. It is twisted. It is unnatural. Oh yes, sin has brought in inclinations. Things that happen in your life drive you in a certain way. Do you know the top homosexual in this city come to one of our meetings on a Friday evening, sat through the entire meeting, spoke to me for about 45 minutes. Some of you will remember it. I had the most wonderful conversation for 45 minutes and he was the top guy in this city. My heart broke for him. I said, you'll, you'll always be welcome in this church. Come back anytime. He says, can I bring my partner? I said, please do bring him as well. And we began to talk, but he asked me this question. He said, why do you think I am the way I am? I dare not answer that. I knew wisdom prevailed. I said, I, I don't know. He said, because I was abused as a kid. My heart broke for him. He said, I didn't want to be this way. I don't like being this way, but I will be this way. And I am this way. He said, if I come along to your church, he said, at some point, you'll mention this, won't you, that it's sin? I said, yeah, because I love you. I care about you. I want you to go to heaven. Then he says, I would never come along because I will never break up this relationship. It's too important. That man, unless he finds Christ, is going to have that drive in there. My heart breaks for him. My heart cares about those that are victims, but not deliberate sin. God cannot have mercy in that. We're all victims of sin. Do you know what I would be here this morning? I would be justifying drunkenness. I was a drunkard at 16 years old. I was destroying my life. I destroyed my military career for one night's drunkenness and lying on a beach with a girl. I destroyed my career. Do you think I can justify that and say, you need to understand, I just have a weakness. You need to understand, I believe God's grace will just ignore that. I'm, I'm a drunkard, but I'm a born again drunkard. Not according to the Bible. Not according to the Bible. And it also says thieves. Who are thieves? You take what is not yours. There's a lot of white collar crime that goes on. It said all of these people will not inherit the kingdom of God. So do you see in a marriage, in any relationship or in a relationship with God or in the church, if you remove scripture, all of these clear teachings and commands, you get an unbiblical relationship. You can have a relationship with a woman, children. You can enjoy all the benefits, but it's not biblical. Don't try to say God's favors on it or God's will is in it. It's not. He's against it. It is unbiblical. That tells me that real relationship is defined by scripture. You'll never have a satisfying relationship with someone else or with God without this book. Amen. I can say I had the most remarkable marriage for 16 years with Candace. It had its imperfections. It had its problems. We had to work through things. But I want to tell you, we had something as close to perfection as you can possibly have on this earth. We loved each other with the love of Christ. We had submission in that home. It was wonderful. It, it was a touch of heaven on earth. Literally, we experienced something of God's kingdom coming on the earth. We created that within our four walls in that relationship. But do you know how that came about? This book, we both submitted ourselves. We loved the word of God. And that's what it created. Do you know all those that reject the word of God? They're deceived. They don't do the word of God. But they say, no, there's a Christian marriage. Why is all hell letting loose in that marriage? Why are you just killing each other? 
That's my first point. My second point, a wrongly entered into relationship. This is always a problem. People enter a relationship, start their relationship on the wrong foot. You don't want to do that. You want God to be in it, scripture to mold it, and in your relationship with God. It says in John chapter 10, verse 1, Verily, verily, I say unto you, this is Jesus speaking, the great shepherd, speaking about his sheep. Do you want to know if you're a sheep? Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entered not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. What is a thief and a robber? You take something that doesn't belong to you. You claim benefits that aren't yours. You've stolen them. Do you know, as I parked the car outside before coming in here, I was parking up and I just looked up and the church across the way, I watched this old white haired man come out of the door inside the railings of the church and he begins to, I thought, is he going to do that? I'm going to use it for my sermon this morning. I go, he's actually going to do this in front of me. And he starts climbing up over the iron railing. I thought, this is brilliant material for me to use. This is just confirmation. I'm on the right track here. And this old man, I watched him as he climbs up over, and then he gets over, and then he goes in the next door. Do you know why he done it? He couldn't be bothered. It would have taken him two minutes to go in round through the gateway. But do you know what he decided? No, I'll just climb over rather than walking around. It wouldn't even take two minutes. But this man, for some reason, said, it's too hard to walk around, go through the gate, so I'm going to climb over. Jesus said, when you talk about the church, the sheepfold and sheep in the church, those that climb over, they don't come in the right way. What's my point here? Wrongly entered relationship. How did you get into Christ? How did you get born again? Can you tell me? Those that climb over the fence, Jesus said they're thieves and robbers. That's only people who don't come in the right way, who don't come in the biblical way, the true way, the taught way. Those who don't come in the biblical way are thieves and robbers. They get into the church. They claim to have a relationship with God. But do you know what they are? They're thieves. They say, I deserve forgiveness. I have cleansing. I have Jesus. God will answer my prayers. You know what the Bible says? You're a thief. You're trying to steal things when you didn't come in the right gate. You come in the wrong way. Jesus says in John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Turn to Nicodemus, a religious man, a mature man, A man who knew the Old Testament inside out, the Bible, he knew it, he taught it, he spoke about it, he's professional in it, he's proficient, he's known God from a child. Listen to what Jesus says unto him, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Again in verse 7 he says, ye must be born again. There's no other way. Absolute no other way into the kingdom of God without being born again. What is the new birth? In verse 3 and verse 7, Jesus uses the term twice here, born again. You don't get into the kingdom. You haven't started. Here he is speaking to a religious leader of massive knowledge and experience. A man who spoke to Jesus very respectably and respectively. But was Jesus say, you can't get in. What you have, you're claiming to be in, but you haven't been born again. What is Jesus talking about? The term means to be born from above. Not just born again a second time, but born from above. A heavenly birth, a supernatural, a second birth. You had your first physical birth, but there's got to be a second one. You can't get into a relationship. 
You've got no relationship with God unless you enter correctly. If it's not a biblical entrance by the right door, in the right way, at the right time, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, you have not been born again. These people who climb in over the hedge, you know what they are? They're thieves. They are robbers. They are getting into the sheepfold to grab, claim for themselves things that do not belong to them. It's only offered to those who come in the right way. Listen, I like Pilgrim's Progress. At a time in the English-speaking world, this was, apart from the Bible itself, this book was the number one bestseller throughout Britain and America and across the English-speaking world. It is the most extraordinary book written by John Bunyan of Bedford. He was a Puritan preacher, a godly man. He was a remarkable, the tinker from Bedford who got thrown in prison for, I think it was 11 years for preaching the gospel. They say, John, stop preaching or we'll put you in prison. Send me to prison then. They threw him to prison. Do you know his little daughter died while he was in there? And he started writing this story, this novel, this remarkable book. He'd write chapters of it and he'd pass it through the bars. And then his wife would read it to all the children round the fire at night. And he'd written this and it'd become a Christian classic. And it's the story of Christian Pilgrim's progress. Pilgrim who starts on a journey to the celestial city. And it goes through all of these different things he had to face, all the deceptions, all the sidetracks. Do you know you're going to face many battles in this journey on your way to heaven? Do you realize how dangerous this journey is? Listen to what he says here. He deals with what I'm talking about here. I'm going to read you a little bit because most people have never read Pilgrim's Progress. Sometime I'm going to do a whole series on the characters from Pilgrim's Progress. I want to do this for 10 years. I'm going to do it one of these days. Just take the characters and begin to show you scripturally where they are. It's a beautiful story. You're going to see it here. Listen, you'll see that it's taken all from scripture. Christians saw two men come tumbling over the wall on the left side and onto the pathway. They immediately came towards Christian. The name of the one was formalist and the name of the other was hypocrisy. Soon they were walking with Christian on the pathway. Christian immediately began to engage them in conversation. Christian asked them, gentlemen, where did you come from and where are you going? Formality and hypocrisy replied, we were born in the land of vain glory and are going to the Mount Zion where we expect we will receive both praise and honor. Why didn't you enter in by the gate that stands at the beginning of the way? Don't you know that it is written that he who does not come in by the door but climbs up some other way is a thief and a robber? Formalist and hypocrisy answered that to go to the gate in order to enter into the way was considered by them and all of their countrymen to be too inconvenient and roundabout journey, especially since they could shorten their journey by simply climbing over the wall as they had done. But won't you be trespassing then? Christian asked. Don't you think the Lord of the city for which we are bound must count it as a violation of his revealed will? Formalist and hypocrisy told Christian not to worry about it since it had been the custom of their land for more than a thousand years. And after all, let me insert this. If your church believes this a thousand years, it must be okay then if they've been doing this for a thousand years. But ask Christian, will your custom stand up in a court of law? They replied, this custom of entering in the way by taking the shortcut has been going on as long-standing practice for more than a thousand years and would be ruled as a legal practice by any impartial judge. And besides, they added, as long as we go into the way, 
What does it matter how we get in the way? If we are in, we are in. You came into the way through the narrow gate and we came tumbling over the wall. And since we are both in, who's to say that your chosen path is better than ours? Christian told them, I walk by the rule of my master. You walk by the rule working of your own notions. You are condemned as thieves already by the Lord of the way. Therefore, I doubt you will be found as true men at the end of the journey. You came in by yourselves without his direction and will go out by yourselves without his mercy. To this they had little to say except to tell Christian to mind his own business. Then I saw that formalist and hypocrisy went along with Christian saying only that as far as the law, laws and ordinances were concerned, they would obey them as consciously as any Christian. They added that they saw no difference between themselves and Christian except for the coat he wore, which they speculated was given to Christian to hide his shame and nakedness. Christian responded, you will not be saved by keeping laws and ordinances. You cannot be saved because you did not come in by the door. As for the coat that is on my back, it was given to me by the Lord of that place where I am going to. As you say, it is a cover for my nakedness. It is indeed. I take it as a token of his kindness to me, for I had nothing but rags before this. Beside, I take some comfort in the fact that when I come to the gate of the city, the Lord of that place will surely recognize me since it is his coat on my back, a coat that he gave me the day that he stripped me of my rags. I also have a mark on my forehead, which perhaps you have not noticed. One of my Lord's most intimate associates placed it on my forehead the day that the burden of sin fell from my shoulders. Also, I've been given a scroll to read as a comfort to me as I make my journey. I was also told to turn it in at the celestial gate as an assurance that I will be welcomed into the celestial city. I doubt you have any interest in all these things since you did not come in by the gate. To this formalist and hypocrisy gave no reply. They just looked at each other and laughed. Then I saw that they all kept walking along the path, except that Christian walked up ahead and had no more conversation with formalist and hypocrisy. He only talked with himself, sometimes sighing, sometimes encouraging himself, and often refreshing himself by reading from the scroll that one of the shining ones had given to him. Mr. Bullion depicted what I'm saying here, that unless, <clears throat> that so many make a mess of relationships, all relationships, because it's wrongly entered into, if you start a relationship with sexual immorality, our pride, arrogance, our lust, our covetousness, do you not think the end of that's going to be disaster for that relationship? You could say, oh, but I love them, but you have an agenda, a motive. There's problems ahead, I promise you. But more so in your relationship with God. If you're not born right, if you don't start right, if you don't begin right, how will you ever finish right? That is utter impossibility. You see, the born again experience is a spiritual resurrection from the dead. You first have to be a sinner, self-professed dead. People claim conversion, climb over the wall. They've never once found themselves to be dead, proved to be a sinner. They've never hung over hell. They've never confessed how wicked their own heart is. Yet they jump the wall and claim all the benefits as thieves. But the born again experience means you've been made alive. You've been converted. 
You've been turned around. You've been saved, made a new creature, been given a new heart, a new spirit. You've entered a new covenant of grace. You've experienced regeneration to be made alive. That's what it is. Listen to what Jesus says to Nicodemus. How can a man, sorry, listen to what Nicodemus says to Jesus. How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb to be born again? And then in verse 9, Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answers him, Art thou a master, a teacher in Israel of the Jews with the Old Testament in your hand and knowest not these things? You know what he was saying? This isn't a new teaching, the new birth. Being born again is in the Old Testament. If he said this to Nicodemus, it means I'm talking about being born again. It's all through the Old Testament. It's everywhere. When you talk to people and they say, what do you mean born again? You talk to people who claim to know God and they've never been born again. What, don't you read your Bible? It's obvious. That's what Jesus said to Nicodemus. You're a scholar. You're a teacher. You know the Bible inside out. Why don't you know this? You'll find it in Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah. It's as plain as day for those who enter correctly the right way. Several years ago, I taught 12 messages in a series called Born Again. Do you know in the past three years, I've sent out several hundred times, if not thousands of times, to people saying, watch this series. Sinners all around the world come inquiring. Are Christians unsure? I said, listen, this series on being born again. It took me 12 messages just to cover it basically of what the Bible teaches about being born again. We're in a generation that everyone says, oh, we know what it means to be born again. Say a sinner's prayer. Don't believe the lies of the devil. There you go. Climb over the wall. Do whatever. Listen, this is what I'm going to close with. The new birth, any birth, ladies who have had children, did you have your child without any discomfort or pain? Did it just pop out and you didn't notice? Oh, Paul, guess what? I just had Thomas in the middle of the night, but I slept through it. No way. It's impossible to have a new birth without great straining, pressure, agony. It says born again. It's a spiritual birth. Listen to what Jesus says in Luke 13, 24. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. Do you know what the word strive means? Agonize, wrestle, fight. Jesus commands this. Lots of people got in without any striving. Agony. Did you have agony to come into this kingdom? Were you birthed, pop, painlessly, without any confusion or wrestling or conviction of sin? I would worry about you then. Do you know what it says? Strive to enter. This is the words of Christ. Strive, agonize to enter and begin your journey with agony, wrestling. Make sure you get the beginning right. Because if you don't get the beginning right, the birth right, everything's going to be wrong. You could be on the pathway, keeping command, saying I'm okay, but you've never been born again. It means nothing unless you started the right way. Merely being in church, doing the right things is not enough. Jesus said, strive. I say unto you, you will seek to enter in and shall not be able to. See, when you get to the end of the journey, you're going to say, let me in. Who are you? Oh, but I've been on the way. I don't know who you are. You weren't born right. Where's your birth certificate? Jesus goes further with this in Matthew 7, 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate. That's the beginning. Do you know what straight means? It means narrow. 
Do you know how I identify the new birth or the message about the real born again experience? The entrance in is narrow, not broad. You know, Matthew 7, when Jesus teaches about the narrow gate and the broad gate, the narrow way and the broad way, he's not talking about all the Christians over here and all the atheists and the world over here. He's not talking about that. Do you know what he's talking about? Two entrance ways, two beginnings, two ways to be saved. Two different teachings in the church about how to be born again. He's not talking about the sinners out there. They're not the ones on the broad way. He's saying there's two teachings of being born again in the church. And you know what? One of them is taught by false prophets. And you know how you identify that? It's a broad entrance way. Wide. Many go in there. There's no agony, no striving, no pressing in. You can get in and still be covetous or a fornicator in heart or or a liar. You could be all those things. You know what? You got in at a different way than I got in. Jesus says, enter in at the straight gate, the narrow way. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there are which go in thereat. Go in there at. It's an entrance way. This is a false gospel that you have a wide gate, a wide entrance, and you say, I've got in. Because straight is the gate. And this is why Jesus says this. Why is it that leads to destruction? Because real conversion, the new birth, begins at a narrow gate. You can't come in here with your sin or your idolatry your statues, your covetousness, your immorality, your game plan, your false accusation. You think you can start this journey with all of that baggage? Remember Jesus said it's harder for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven than it is for a camel to enter in through the eye of a needle. He's not talking about the needle you hold in your hand. You know, in Jerusalem, in the city, at night time, as it got to about six o'clock and darkness is coming in and the gates were closed, the big gates. Do you know what the eye of the needle was? It was a small gate within the big gate. And so when you brought your camel in or your horses in and they had all of their big loads, the camel, it's late at night, you've got to get in there. The camel had to go down on its knees. And you had to drag that camel in through the eye of the needle. That's what Jesus is speaking about. And you know what? You're going to have to take all the burdens off, all the packages, all your wealth. And you say, I want it all to come in. It ain't coming in here this night. Your camel needs to get on its knees. You're going to have to drag. You're going to have to take everything off. No, I want to bring it all in. Sorry, mate. It ain't going to happen. You need to try a different city. And you realize that's what Jesus is saying. A rich man, you may want wealth. Do you know riches? And believe me, all of us are rich. In the light of what the Bible says, if you've got regular food, you've got things ancient kings didn't have. And he says, do you realize how dangerous that is? That all that wealth, comfort, and you have in everything It could so deceive you. It's so hard. If you have that, I want to tell you, it's hard for you. It's not impossible. It's hard to get into the kingdom of God. Because you know what? All of that, you don't want to let go of it. And it's such a burden that you hold on to it. My message, a search for a perfect relationship. And I believe within the heart of every person is a desire in this world to have perfect relationships. And that's good. That there's nothing wrong with that. But please, that's only a faint reflection of that perfect relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It alone will satisfy. It will alone sustain you and keep you. And I want to tell you, many people claim to have a relationship with God and claim to be in a relationship with him, 
but their relationship is utterly unbiblical. The Bible clearly shows that they are not in this. And the Bible shows they were never born of God. They're thieves claiming what is not theirs. And you know what? What a dangerous place it is to be. To stay there is to be in deception. But to repent, to wake up, to turn to Christ is to experience salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for <clears throat> your word this morning. We believe in providence, just your hand to be upon things. And we pray for your guidance and your good and goodness. Lord God, I pray, oh God, let your voice be heard clearly. Don't let us be deceived, oh God. Deal with our hearts, deal with our lives. We want, oh God, that new birth, that real birth of having entered in through the narrow gate to walk on the narrow way, hedged in. Lord God, we don't want to be in a broad way, nor God, without commands and instructions, without convictions, without dealings of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the restraint and the holy conviction of your spirit. You're very gracious, O oh God. You said that if we're not chastened for our sins, then we're illegitimate. We don't belong to you. We are never born again. If you do not deal with our hearts, if you do not chasten us and, and rebuke us and correct us and deal with things in our heart, then we have no place in your kingdom. Father, I do pray, oh God, raise up godly marriages, raise up godly friendships. And Lord God, most of all, Lord God, raise up in this church those that really have a genuine born again experience sent from God in Jesus' mighty name.